Good morning, Mason Burr. Please join me for this morning's call to worship. Break open our hearts this morning to hear your word. Come and let us worship with great joy. God is about to do something new in our lives. Amen. Now let's pray together. Lord, bless us who have gathered in your presence and who turn to you in tough times, God. In you, Father, we have faith that gives us strength to go on even when life is hard. Lord, help us that we may help others. And thank you, God, for giving us so much grace. Father, may all people throughout the world praise your name. Amen. will bow down and every chain will break as broken hearts declare their praise for who can stop the Lord Almighty our God is a lion the lion of Judah he's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb and every knee will bow before him So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. And every knee will bow before Him. stop the Lord Almighty who can 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 stop the Lord Judah, he's roaring with power. 
I get these calls a lot, and I bet you probably do too, where it'll be from a local number, but it's a number that I don't recognize. And of course, I never answer it when I don't recognize the number, but they'll leave a voicemail. And this voicemail will be this person speaking as though we are friends, that we've been friends for a long time, and it'll usually it'll go something like this. Hey, John, this is Katie. I'm just calling you back about that loan you're pre-approved for. Give me a call back and, and let us know when you want us to disperse it. Now, of course, I never applied for any loan, and so it's a scam or it's a salesperson or whatever. But I didn't even need to get that far into the message to know that it was a hoax. They lost me as soon as they called me John. Now, my first name is actually John. I am John Wesley. That's a good Methodist name if ever there was one. But nobody calls me John except for telemarketers in my doctor's office. Most people go by their first name. You know, so you can, you can look at a generic record of someone and you can make it sound like you know them, like you're a long lost friend. But that doesn't work for me. For me, you have to at least know who I am to know my name. I may be John on paper, but if you know me, you know better than that. See, there's power in a name. Names are meaningful. My name matters to me. And not because I'm named after the founder of Methodism, but because I'm named after my dad. I'm proud of that. Alexis is named after one of her grandfathers. My boys, Mason and Banks, are named after Mason's Inlet and Banks Channel because Alexis and I are both from here and we've spent a lot of time on the water. We did a lot of our dating, our our courting, so to speak, down on the water. And we spent a lot of our early marriage going out in the boat and spending time on the water. So those places are sacred to us. Their middle names, Mason and Banks' middle names, come from our grandfathers because we, uh, we grew up with our grandparents. And our grandparents are important to us. And we want to remember them. We want their names to live on. So today we're going to look at the next line of the Lord's Prayer. Last week we talked about what it means that we call God our Father. God is personal. He's not a force or an idea. He's not a set of values. God is himself. He's personal and he's relational. In directing us to call God our Father, Jesus is adopting us into the royal household. Jesus had the right to call God Father because of who he was. We are granted that privilege because Jesus included us. And God, our Father, who wants us to know him, is the same God who rules over all creation. He's seated in heaven. To say that God is personal, that doesn't mean that our relationship with him is only between us and him. God rules over all of creation. To be called his children is to be caught up in something cosmic that includes everything that is and that stretches into eternity. In John's Gospel, in chapter 3, Jesus says that he came into the world, that he was sent into the world so that the whole world, the cosmos, through him, might be saved. All of creation might be saved through him. That's the God to whom we pray, our Father who is in heaven. He rules over creation, and he is personal. And today, what we're going to talk about is that he's so personal, in fact, that he has a name. Here's the Lord's Prayer from the NIV translation. Last week we read from the Common English. And we're going to go back and reference that some here in a little while. But this is the NIV translation of the Lord's Prayer. From the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus instructs his disciples to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So hallowed be your name, or hallowed be thy name, which we say in the King's James. What does that mean? What does it mean to hallow something? We're going to take a look at the significance of God's name in Scripture in just a minute. Morning, everyone. It's time for Children's Church. So come on over close to the TV if you're not already there. And let's see what the Lord's going to tell us today. Um, if you've got your Bibles, you can look up the book Ecclesiastes 
chapter 3, verse 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11. Now, Ecclesiastes, if you're trying to find it by yourself, is in the very middle of the book. So if you open up your Bible to the middle, you might be at Psalms or Proverbs, and then you go one more over, and you'll find Ecclesiastes. It's a very long word, and it starts with the letter E. So put your finger on your Bible verse, Ecclesiastes 3, 11, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. Now, anybody that's new that's just joining us, uh, we have been studying special words each month since last August when we started back to school. So each month we take a word and we look at it and we dig into the Bible to find how can we be more like Jesus and apply this word to help us be a better person. Now, back here on my door, I've got some words, and I'm going to read them to you because some of you can't read or you might not be able to see it. <clears throat> and I want you to see if you can remember if there's a new word that we haven't done before, all right? I've got the word kindness, patience, alike and different, and love, and beautiful. Now, which word have we not looked at yet? If you said beautiful, you are right. So the month of May, we're going to be looking in our Bible for verses and seeing what the word beautiful means. Now, if you look at Ecclesiastes 3.11, this is what it says. I've wrote it down for you in bigger words to put up here for you. And it says, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Let's say that again. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Let's do it one more time. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Ecclesiastes 3.11. Now, who do you think he is? Who made everything? You're right. God did. God made everything everything in its time. Now, you know what? As I read that, I thought, hmm, that reminds me of patience. Do you think God was patient when he was making everything, the world and everything in it? Do you think he got impatient and mad or uh, upset? Maybe he Got really mad? No, 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 no. I don't think God got mad. I think God is patient. I think God is kind. And our Bible tells us that it, he is. So we don't have to guess. We know. So when God made the world, he made it with love and kindness and patience. And then he was very grateful for what he made. He liked it. He thought it was beautiful, just like our Bible verse says. Let's see if we can say it without Miss Tracy pulling it up. What did it start with? He, he made everything beautiful in its time. Found in Ecclesiastes 3.11. Good job. Now, I've got a little game I want to play with you to see if you can guess what I am describing. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna describe something in your house at, that's gonna give you a beautiful, beautiful sight. So this word that I'm thinking of, it's in your house, probably in your bathroom, probably hanging on a wall. Maybe it's in another room in your house. Maybe it's in a drawer with a handle. What do you think I'm thinking of that would show us beauty or beautiful? If you said a mirror, you are right. So I want you this next week to find a mirror and look in it and see how beautiful God has made you. And also, I want you to do something for me. I want you to think of something in your world, in your house, in your room, somewhere that you think is beautiful. 
And then I want you to get someone to help you to write it down. And I want you to send it to me in an email. And then we'll share it with everybody next week. So I want to hear from all of you all that are watching. Send us an email and let it be what is beautiful to you. And we'll share those things next week together. Okay? Have a great week. Love you. Miss you. And we will talk again soon. See you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. So names matter, and in the ancient Near Eastern world, they mattered even more than they do now. Theirs was a society built around families and family names. Land ownership dictated status, and land was passed down through families. And wealthy families had servants, and we tend to associate that with slavery, and we tend to think of servants as being people who are oppressed, but a wealthy family's servant was held in high esteem, and depending on his rank in the household, he would sometimes represent the family in business. For example, in Matthew 18, Jesus tells a parable about a servant who owes his master 10,000 bags of gold. The master forgives the debt, and then the servant goes out and doesn't do the same thing to somebody else. The point of the parable is that God forgives so much in us that we are obliged to forgive others the same way. The Lord's Prayer actually gets into that too. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But the parable begs the question, just the setup to the parable begs the question, how could a servant owe more money than he could earn in a thousand lifetimes? 
10,000 bags of gold converted to today's money would be over $7 billion. Now, obviously, he wasn't loaned that money. He didn't get a, a call from Katie who said, hey, we've pre-approved you for, for a $7 billion loan. He didn't borrow that money from his master. The way it works is that this guy was a high-ranking servant in his master's household, and he had been put in charge of the household finances. He had invested them, and he had embezzled some for himself. No day laborer could earn billions of dollars. No day laborer could invest billions of dollars. He could only do it because he was operating under his master's name. So having the right name attached could turn a slave into Warren Buffett. Granted, a version of Warren Buffett who wasn't very good at investing and who was dishonest. The point is, in the ancient Near East, names conveyed power. If I do something in your name, it's as though you are doing it. The story of God's people being liberated from bondage begins with names. In Exodus 3, Moses is tending his father-in-law's flock when he hears a voice call him by name, Moses, from out of a bush that's on fire. And that voice identifies itself as the voice of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses' ancestors. God tells Moses that he's going to set his people free, and Moses is going to be the one to do it. We're going to come back to this passage in Exodus next week and talk about why God wants to do this in the first place. Today, we're talking about how God's going to do it. And the how is Moses. And that leads Moses to ask the same question that I would ask, that I expect many of us would ask. And here's what he says in Exodus chapter 3, verse 11. He says, who am I to go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? It's a good question. Because this job is too big for Moses. Moses used to be an adopted prince of Egypt, but now he's a runaway with a stutter, wanted for murder, tending somebody else's sheep. He's nobody. Who am I to do this thing? And God answers that question. And he answers it with five of the most powerful words in the Bible. He says this in verse 12. Here's what he says. He says, I will... Be with you. Who am I to set the people free from bondage? Well, you're nobody. But I will be with you. The you doesn't much matter. It's the I that matters. Yes, it's too big for you. It's too big for you, Moses. But I will be with you. So far, all Moses knows about this God is his title, the God of his ancestors. And so Moses says, look, if I go back to the people and tell them the God of their ancestors sent me to them, they're not going to believe me. If I'm going to be your representative, I need to go in your name. What's your name? Now, there's a big difference between the hired help and the one that's been given responsibility for the household, the servant that carries the householder's name. That's a big difference. And up to this point in the biblical narrative, God had not revealed his name to anyone, not to Abraham or Isaac or Jacob or anybody else. God had been active in the lives of many people, but none had been given the authority of his name. Until now. Here in Exodus 3, Verse 14, God discloses his name to Moses. The English transliteration of the Hebrew word is Yahweh. Yahweh is a hard word to translate into English because tenses are weird in Hebrew. Most Bible translations put it simply as I am. Tell them that I am sent you. It's closer to translate it something like I am who I am or I will be I will be present to whomever I am present, something like that. We don't really have the language to nail down exactly what it is that God's name means. We certainly don't have the time in this sermon, but the point here is that whatever the name means, God gave it to Moses. God sends Moses in the name of God, not in the name of Moses. God names Moses his representative and bestows on him all the responsibility and all the authority that comes along with being God's representative. Pharaoh is eventually going to get the idea of what that means, but not until he's stuck in the middle of a sea with water crashing down on him from all sides and his army all, 
all perishing in front of him. But you see, names are important. And the people of Israel will continue to treat God's name as sacred in their religious practice all throughout their history. In fact, even to this day, Jewish people will not read the name of God when it's written in the Torah. If the word Yahweh is written, they substitute Adonai, which is a more generic name that means Lord. Like much of God's activity in Israel, the hallowing of God's name became a matter of ritual, a matter of religious practice. But in the New Testament, we discover that God was not finished revealing his name to his people. And in the person of Jesus, we find both a revelation of who God is and what it means to truly uphold the holiness of his name. We're going to finish this up with a look at the New Testament. But before we do that, Donna Garner and Ray Holland are going to lead us in prayer. Good morning. Thanks for joining us for Sunday worship. We hope you're all well, and uh, we want you to know that we love you and we miss you. And while so much has changed these past few weeks with um, social distancing, um, thanks to technology and our staff and uh, members that know how to use that technology, because I don't, uh, we can still get to hear God's Word and song each Sunday. And that means a lot to me because I can sit here with my dad for worship, something that we've been able to do at Masonburg for what, maybe 60 years? 60 years. 60 years? Yeah, that's wonderful. Tell us something that you really like about online church, Dad. It, uh, you can um, make it sound like you like it, and then uh, if you want to hear something again, you can go back and play it again. Yeah, what's something that you really miss about getting dressed and going to church? Uh, just seeing my grandchildren and, and great grandchildren, and uh, passing the uh, and singing with them, and passing the offering plate up and down and back again. Yeah, that is special, and that's something we need to remember to keep on doing. We need to remember to pass that offering plate, whether it's by online giving. Um, which is something I've had to set up and do in the last few weeks, and it was very easy. If you need more information about that, you can visit our website. Just click on online giving. It's easy to set up. Or you can drop a check in the mail each week. We, we really prefer uh, one of those two options. Those are the best options right now, as we just don't have consistent um, staff at the church at this time. So online giving or drop a, mail, a check in the mail, that would be great. And again, a big thank you to everyone who's helping bring Sunday worship into our living rooms each week and keeping us connected until we can all meet again. Let's go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, over and over, your grace sustains us. Over and over, you provide for us and your arm steadies us. Your word says that we would find joy in offering our time, our talents, and our tithes to meet the needs of others. Help us to be general givers, dear Lord, with both our money and our lives, that we might make a difference. Not because you make us, not because anyone's watching. We give because we're grateful and because we want to be part of the work of your kingdom in every way that we can. We ask this through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our yes. Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Tell me of a home far beyond the sky. Oh, they tell me of a land far away. Oh, they tell me of a home where no storm clouds rise. Oh, they tell me of an uncloudy day. Oh, the land of cloudless days.
So what do we mean when we say, hallowed be thy name, hallowed be thy name? Hallowed is not a word we often use in conversation. Sometimes you'll see it translated as holy, which is not exactly right. It's not exactly wrong, but it doesn't convey the whole meaning of it. We don't pray for God's name to be holy because God's name is already holy, regardless of what we have to say about it. To be holy means to be set apart. It means to be outside of the ordinary, to be beyond it, to be above it. We talked about the significance of names in the ancient world. So to say that God's name is holy is to recognize that God himself is holy. And God's holiness, God's set-apartness, does not depend on us acknowledging it. 
God is holy regardless of what you or I or what the world thinks about it or says about it. But that's not really what hallowed means anyway. The Common English Bible has a helpful translation of this verse, of this phrase. Here's what it says. It says, Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Uphold the holiness of your name. To hallow something is to recognize its holiness and treat it as such. To uphold it. When we pray in the Lord's Prayer for the name of God to be hallowed, we are stating that it is our will that God's name will be treated by us, by the world, by all of creation as holy. We're also accepting our responsibility as the community charged with working to make that happen. If I'm going to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, I had better mean it. Because that prayer is going to impact every area of my life, every relationship, every decision. If you're going to pray this, you better mean it. This is no empty worded formality. This is no prayer for hypocrites or heathens. This declaration sets up the entire rest of the prayer. And as a matter of fact, it works nicely as a summary of what Christian discipleship is. When we accept the call to follow Jesus and we pray that we want to see the name of God hallowed, we are declaring that our lives have now become devoted to the glory of God instead of the glory of us. When I pray this, I'm praying that I want to and that I will work to see God's name hallowed instead of mine. When you pray this, that's what you're praying. And that is a bold thing to pray because nothing could run more against the grain of our society than this does. If we think about what we're praying, nothing we declare in this prayer will come easily. We all want to make a name for ourselves. That's how we're wired. We're, we want to be set apart. We want to be thought of as special, as good at our jobs, as attractive, as likable, as successful. And we want our kids to be the same way. We all, by nature, want the set-apartness of our names to be upheld by the world around us. I have been wired for that since I was born, and so have you. But Jesus instructs us to pray for something very differently. And to live our lives in the service of something very different. And that is that God's name will be upheld as holy instead of mine. Instead of our names. And that's our job. Because like the servant in Jesus' parable, we have been given responsibility for the stewardship of God's household. We, the church of Jesus Christ, are his representatives in the world. We live and move and interact with others in the name of Jesus. And with that comes responsibility and authority. Peter and John figured this out. In the third chapter of Acts, Peter and John are approached at the temple by a crippled man who's asking them for money. And Peter said, I don't have any money. But in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And that's exactly what the man did. He got up and walked. And a bunch of people saw it and they were amazed by it. And that got back to the temple authorities who arrested Peter and John and brought them in for an explanation. Listen to how Peter explains it to them. This is from Acts chapter 4. It says, Then Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, answered, Leaders of the people and elders, are we being examined today because something good was done for a sick person? A good deed that healed him? If so, then you and all the people of Israel need to know that this man stands healthy before you because of the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. He has become the cornerstone. Salvation can be found in no one else. Throughout the whole world, no other name has been given among humans through which we must be saved. When God's representatives go into the world in His name, in the name of Jesus, that's when healing happens. That's when restoration happens. That's when salvation happens. Whatever comes in the aftermath of this virus, if it's going to be a better world than it was before, it's not going to happen in the name of me or in the name of you or in the name of any politician or any other person on this earth. The world will only improve if the people who call themselves disciples of Jesus go forth in his name in order to see that the holiness of his name is upheld. Salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name 
that can save. The Lord's Prayer doesn't let us go through the motions. It's not something we can leave at the church doors. Just like the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, it calls us into a radically different lifestyle than the rest of the world around us. That begins here with the very first line. We, the representatives of Jesus who bear his name, we declare that our lives are lived for the purpose of seeing his name hallowed, seeing his holiness upheld. That's what you and I were created to do. That's what we were called together as a church to do. And that is what this world so desperately needs. Our Father in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. That is what Jesus teaches us to pray. And that's the good news of the gospel for us today. Thanks be to God. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And spoke your name into the Through the darkness, your love and kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my
Thanks for joining us today for worship. Whether you're a member of our church or you're somebody who's just looking in from another place, you are welcome here and we're glad that you worshiped with us. If there's anything we can pray for you about, just let us know. You can email our church office at office at masonboroughbaptist.org. Know that I'm, I'm praying for our church. I'm praying for each of you and praying for the world. Uh, we will be back together again soon. Until then, receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.